So I thought I would start today um, just by uh, having us figure out who we are. Um, you probably have never heard me, and I don't really know you guys. So um, I thought I would start first and kind of tell you a little bit about myself. And then I was hoping we could go around and each of you could say who you are. And you might already have done this and you might know each other. So I apologize, but I don't know who you are. So I would, I would appreciate hearing who you are. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to give you some visual clues. And you can let me know if um, you can figure out what they mean about me. Okay, so your first clue is a Hershey kiss. Any thoughts about why I put a Hershey kiss up there? I'm not from Virginia is the answer. I am from right outside of the town of Hershey. So I'm not sure where you guys are from. I'm going to find out that in a little bit, but I come from a town called Palmyra, which is right next to Hershey, Pennsylvania, and we're known for our kisses. Uh, I went to college uh, with that mascot, so I am a Penn Stater. So um, that's going to be problematic here in the fall if football happens, because Penn State and Virginia Tech are supposed to play each other, which is going to be stressful. Uh, but just so you know my background, I uh, went to Penn State, and I got two degrees there. I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from uh, what well, at the time was called the industrial engineering department. And now it's, uh, they added another middle name. So industrial manufacturing engineering. So I got a bachelor's degree. That's your regular four year degree. And then another two years for master's. And then when I was done with that, I moved to Virginia Tech uh, to get a PhD. So that's, uh, kind of like a professor degree at where, where they call you doctor, if you have one of those. And my department then was the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. It's, it's really kind of the same thing. Uh, just different people call it different stuff. Um, so I, I got my PhD there. That took four years, I think. And then um, after that, I started uh, having kids and I, I, I taught a lot for them as an instructor. And I probably taught there for like 17 years in the College of Engineering. And about three years ago, I moved over to teach pretty much the same stuff, but in the College of Business now instead of in the College of Engineering. So I can talk to you a little bit about what the differences are between engineering and uh, business if you're interested in that later. Um, the programs I teach, like I said, they were, they're offered in both places. So um, those are great. Um, this probably means absolutely nothing to you, uh, but I am the faculty advisor for a group that's called APEX. And the problem with APEX is that what it stands for, they don't want to really tell you anymore because it's like the terminology has changed. Um, but this is what the parent organization is called. It's called the Association for Supply Chain Management. And that you might have heard about. So this year, you've probably heard more about supply chain in the news than you would have any other year. So the idea about supply chains is we build mathematical models to figure out the most efficient and effective ways to get products from the start to the finish. So we figure out the routing that people should, how should the trucks go to deliver the different packages? Um, how much should we make? Um, where should we get our supplies from? all that kind of stuff. So uh, I teach in the area that's called supply chain management. Uh, personally, I have a husband who have been married to for 24 years and we have three kids, 17 year old, a 15 year old and one week away from being 12 year old. So, um, and then um, just another kind of personal thing, I play the piano. So uh, I play the piano at my church and do all the music there. So I like math, I like music um, anyway. So my next question is going to be about you guys. And I, I know you've probably done this um, already, but I'm going to just kind of call on you in the order I see in the screen. And if you could unmute yourself and just tell me a little bit about like what, why you're here and what your name is, obviously. And, um, you know, what you're interested in, that kind of stuff. So the first person I see is Anna. Anna, can you just tell me who you are, hon? Hello. Yes, my name is Anna. And um, why I'm here. Is it like, why did I decide to apply to CTEC? Anything, whatever you okay. want to say. 
Um, There's no wrong answer. I do like engineering, so I thought it would be pretty cool. And also because I wanted to have something to do over the summer. And then um, what I'm interested in, I'm interested in sort of like electrical engineering or CS, or maybe computer engineering, because it's kind of like a combination between the two. So yeah. Awesome. And also tell me, are you guys going to be seniors next year or juniors? Uh, I'm a rising junior. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. All right. I see Laurel next. Hi, my name is Laurel. I am a rising senior, and I'm from Roanoke, Virginia. And I'm in oh, I'm in Salem. Hi, we're near each other. And I'm interested in aerospace engineering. Nice. All right, thanks, Laurel. Next, I see Maya. Maya, um, I'm from Falls Church, Virginia. Or at least, well, I'm living there right now. Um, I'm a rising senior, and I go to George Mason High School. If that means anything. Um, I applied to CTEC because I kind of wanted to learn more about engineering. My school doesn't really offer that many courses in that, like, that kind of field. And I think I'm interested in mechanical engineering and sustainable development. All right. Awesome. Next one I see is Caitlin. Hi. Um, I'm Caitlin, a rising senior. Uh, I'm interested in environmental, uh, environmental engineering. And I was going to say something else. I can't remember anything. It's too early for me, honestly. Oh, hey, I hear you. If it comes back, jump back in and tell us later. All right, next I see Jillian. Hi, I'm Jillian. Um, I'm a rising junior, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I applied to CTEC because I just kind of want to get a feel for, like, um, different fields of engineering. And I'm really interested in biomedical engineering and mechanics and uh, robotics. All right, cool. Thanks, Jillian. All right, Kalina. Um, yeah, but I'm Kalina. I currently live in Fairfax, Virginia, and I applied to CTEC just so I could get a feel for like all fields of engineering. But I'm like the most interested in like the biomed, biosystems departments. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Kalina. Next, I see Eileen. Hello, my name is Eileen. Um, I'm from Cerritos, California, which is like uh, 30 minutes from Los Angeles. Um, I'm a rising junior, and I applied for CTEC because um, I'm really invested in the idea of, like, women in STEM and engineering, and I wanted to, like, I guess learn more about engineering, but also learn more about, like, like uh, how women can be involved in that. Okay, awesome. I'm all about that. Um, next, I see Elizabeth. Yes. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I'm a rising senior. I applied to CTEC because I want to learn more about engineering, and I'm really interested in chemical engineering. Oh, nice. All right, excellent. Uh, now I see Allison. Hi, I'm Allison. I'm from Arlington, Virginia, and I'm a rising senior. And I applied to CTEC just to learn more about the different disciplines of engineering, and I'm interested in mechanical and maybe civil. Okay, cool. All right, next is the Asa. Hi, I'm Asa. Um, I'm from Northern Virginia, and I applied to CTEC just to learn about like all the engineering fields. And I'm currently interested in computer science and bi um, biomedical engineering and a little bit of biological systems. Okay, thank you. Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm a rising junior and I applied to CTEC to learn more about engineering. I'm interested in um, biomedical or chemical engineering. Where are you from? I'm from Northern Virginia. Okay. That's my default. I assume you're all from Northern Virginia if you don't tell me otherwise, but I should ask. Uh, okay, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a rising senior. I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia, and I applied to CTEC because I wanted to explore all the different majors and the opportunities within them. And I'm probably most interested in biomedical or chemical engineering. Okay, great. Um, Gracie. Hi, I'm Gracie. Um, I'm from Williamsburg, Virginia. So I'm right next to William and Mary, like two minutes away. Um, I, I'm interested in computer science slash engineering. I, Want, I'm trying CTEC to get a feel for Virginia Tech as a whole, if I like it, if I like their program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about it. Good um, idea. Oh, I'm a rising senior. Okay, thanks. All right, Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm from Northern Virginia. 
I'm a rising senior and I'm interested in mechanical engineering and I applied to C Tech mostly to get like a feel of Virginia Tech and learn a little bit more about the engineering departments. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Courtney. My name's Courtney. I'm a rising junior and I'm from North Carolina and I came to C Tech to just get a feel for like all the different fields of engineering, but I'm mainly interested in biomedical engineering and ocean engineering. Oh, interesting. It's a new one for us. Awesome. Trisha. Okay. Hi, I'm Trisha. I'm a rising junior and I applied to CTEC because I want to learn about the different types of engineering and I'm interested in computer science right now. Okay. Well, always see your cat walking by, Allison. My cats are hiding, um, but I have two of them. I should have said that on my slides. Um, okay, let's see. Did I get everybody? Uh, it's kind of confusing me because it's got you on different pages. So if I missed anybody, yell out. You good? Seems like we, we know each other. All right. And somebody, you can answer this. One of you can unmute and let me know. So is it like the group of you are together all the time or are you with different groups of people, different sessions? This is, we're in the same group for every session. Okay, so you all know each other and you've heard that spiel five times. Okay, but at least I know who you are now. So sorry if, about that. Okay, so uh, that helps me. And it was interesting to hear a lot of you said the biomedical and that kind of stuff. A um, couple computer science, mechanical, things like that, a little electro electrical. But nobody said my major, so I'll be happy to teach you about what that means. But before I do that, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about Virginia Tech and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I'm afraid probably everybody's doing this, uh, but they like to brag. So um, Virginia Tech is uh, pretty old. We were founded in 1872 as a land grant college. So you can look up what that means. But um, Penn State was a land grant college also. Basically, it means the federal government gave land to the states to create universities that would specialize in agricultural and engineering. So a lot of the big colleges that deal with engineering and technical fields were a result of that program. So uh, we're, we've got a, a lot of students. There's, these numbers are probably about two years old, so they might be a little bit different. But most recent numbers I found were that we had about 27,000 students in Blacksburg, 110 buildings, uh, 2,600 acres, a big farm, uh, and our main campus is in this tiny little town called Blacksburg. And if you've never been there, um, I understand because there's not a lot there other than Virginia Tech. It's really quite a small town, but it's lovely and beautiful, and uh, I enjoy it. So um, this is our campus. We have a state-of-the-art hotel and conference center right there. Uh, something called the Corporate Research Center, where we have a lot of kind of innovative ideas that faculty and grad students come up with, and then they spin off into local companies. We have a tiny little airport in Blacksburg that they're making bigger, uh, but most people who fly here fly into Roanoke, which one of you told us that you live in Roanoke, and then it's about a 35-minute drive down to uh, Blacksburg. So there's just some pictures of kind of things around campus. Uh, we do have other locations in case you're not aware of that. Uh, I do some executive teaching, which means basically I teach seminars to, to people who have jobs uh, in Hampton Roads at the center there. But we have centers in uh, Northern Virginia, and we're making a, a bigger one up there. You've probably heard about that Amazon is coming in uh, into that area, and we're going to have an innovation campus up there. Uh, Richmond, Danville, and then there's ag research centers, 4-H centers. So there's we're kind of all across the state uh, doing all kinds of stuff in Virginia. Uh, and we're outside Virginia. We have some locations where people study in other countries, for example, Switzerland. Uh, and then there's graduate research centers in Washington. Hotel Roanoke is owned by us. Um, Washington Alexander Center for uh, College of Architecture and Urban Studies, Marion DuPont, uh, Scott Equine Medical Center. So different things. We're not just in Blacksburg. Uh, the mission is to serve our commonwealth, our state, the nation, and the community through learning, discovery, and engagement. And our motto is Latin, 
ut prusum, which means that I may serve. So we're, we're service oriented. You see that with a lot of our students. Um, so total enrollment on and off camp is, is about 30,000. Most of them are undergraduate students, about four fifths. And the other fifth is graduate students. Many, many of our undergraduate students are from Virginia because we give a big discount. We're a public university for the state of Virginia. So a lot of our students come from Virginia, but a lot do not. So some of you said you're from Chicago and other areas. So we would be happy to have you in Virginia, North Carolina, uh, wherever you might be. Uh, we have about 6,000 grad students 4,500 of which are seeking master's degree, 1140 are getting doctoral degrees like what I have, and 240 are becoming veterinarians. So I'm not sure if you know that, but we have a veterinary college, which is super cool because if you have a pet, um, there's excellent medical care in Blacksburg. If your local vet can't help you out, they always send you over to the college because they have cutting edge technologies going on there. Uh, by the way, we also have a lot of international students, uh, so about it says 26% of our graduate students. So about a quarter of our graduate students are international. And that depends probably on which college you're in. In engineering, I'd say it's a lot higher than 26, uh, but in other majors, it might be different. So we have grad students from 110 different countries. So there's lots of colleges. You guys all seem like you're focused on engineering. And I would encourage you to pursue that. I love women in engineering, but you might want to look at some other options as well. Uh, so there's agriculture and life science. So those of you who are interested in bioengineering, you might find some classes over there that you like. Architecture, science. I teach in the College of Business, which might not be something you've thought about. It's something that does some kind of technical stuff, but it's something that you might be interested in, actually. So I want to make sure I let you know about that. There's also, you'll take classes in liberal arts and human sciences, uh, natural resources, all that kind of stuff. And I mentioned the vet school already, but we also have human medical school as well. Um, that's based out of Roanoke, the Carilion School of Medicine. So there's lots and lots of degrees, 200 of them. When I was your age, I absolutely had no idea what I was going to major in. I don't even think I knew that my major existed when I was your age. So um, you might think you know what you want to do and you might change your mind. In my experience, a lot, a lot of students tend to change their mind. This is a great time for you to go out, explore different things. When you actually get to your university, wherever it is, try out some different classes. And if you find that the thing you thought you wanted to do isn't fun for you, then switch to something that is. That would be my advice. Uh, so I'm on the faculty at Virginia Tech with a lot of other folks. It says there's 1,300. I'm pretty sure it's higher now. 63% um, are what are called tenured faculty. I'm in the other category. So tenured faculty, once you get tenure, the nice thing would be that you really can't lose your job. So people love that. Uh, but I do um, the non-tenured kind of stuff. Um, it says there's a 16 to 1 student-faculty ratio. I'm trusting them on that. I will say we are a big university, so our classes are not that size. They're, they're much larger than that. Okay, if you want to study abroad, Virginia Tech has plenty of opportunities for you to do that. Obviously, right now, that's all shut down. Uh, we had to bring everybody home last uh, March, and I'm pretty sure all of our international programs are suspended right now until we get out of this pandemic. But uh, by the time you guys would be in school, usually you do the study abroad, maybe your sophomore, junior, senior year. I'm sure these programs will be back up and running and something that you would really be interested in. So uh, we're ranked pretty well. We're ranked 27th across the country of best public universities. We're in the top 15 schools uh, in terms of how many patents we receive. That's probably um, a result of us being an engineering school. We're ranked fifth in the nation in ag research, 14th in engineering, which is what most of you guys are interested in. Architecture, we're first in the country. Our business program is 42nd in the country. And the department I'm in, um, we're actually in the top five in our, in, uh, our category across the country. So um, we're known for the Hokie Bird, obviously, that's our mascot. Some other more important, when you're picking schools, like things like this matter, uh, not just like how the major ranks, but this is important stuff. 
Uh, we're ranked number one by students who love their colleges. Number five for the best quality of life. Um, number six, best campus food. Things like this matter actually more than you would think they do. And uh, often we're ranked number one. So uh, I don't, I just happen to grab this photo from somebody else. Number 11, best alumni network. That's really important uh, because when you get your job, a lot of times people tend to hire people that went to the same school that they did. So if you go to a big school, your odds of getting hired go up. Uh, and then happiest students were number 19. So that's Virginia Tech. I don't want to bore you to death with that. Um, I wanted to get more into kind of some of the things you said you wanted to hear about is like, like what are the different kinds of engineering and, and what can folks do? So um, I, as I told you, majored in what's called industrial engineering, which you probably didn't hear about. A lot of folks don't until they get onto campus. But within industrial engineering, the, the lane I'm in is called operations research, and it's also called management science. It tends to be called operations research in engineering schools and management science in business schools, but it's really the same thing. Uh, so what do I do? What does uh, somebody who majors in operations research management science do? So we study real systems. So it could be whatever you want. Sometimes we're doing research on um, cancer treatments. Sometimes we're routing trucks for UPS. Sometimes we're deciding where you should build hospitals. Okay, so whatever your application might be, you look at a real system, you try to identify some kind of problem that's happening, and then narrow down your scope, figure out exactly what it is that you're going to focus on because you can't solve the world. Like what's your little chunk going to look like? And then we build math models. So the math models can look different. Uh, sometimes they're linear, sometimes they're nonlinear. Sometimes they have probabilities in them, sometimes they don't. So sometimes they're computer simulations. There's all kinds of stuff, any kind of math model. And then you figure out how can I solve that math model? And you try to test it with some real life data to make sure it works, come up with some kind of recommended solution and then you implement it basically. So these are some of the things that you do if you have focused on operations research or management science. So some of you said you want to do computer science. A lot of computer science lines up in this lane as well. I'm not sure if you've heard these words before, but things like uh, analytics, sometimes data analytics, business analytics, data mining. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, logistics. I think it's UPS. Um, Somebody has a tagline on their commercials these days about logistics. But logistics means basically how do you get stuff done? How do you move things from point A to point B? I live in the math modeling, mathematical optimization world. That's where I live. I build math models and optimization means how do you do things best? So if you're one of those people that thinks like there's a best way to pack the car, there's a way to organize this better, or like you go to uh, the grocery store and you're like, this isn't working well. We, I could do better. They should do this. They should. This line should go this way, and that line should go this way, and we could make it work more efficiently. That's a lot of mathematical optimization. There's also stuff like financial engineering, probability and statistics, forecasting. So you know forecasting from the weather, obviously, which is trying to predict what's the temperature going to be tomorrow. But it's also like, how do you predict how many people are going to get sick from a virus? Game theory has to do with um, kind of usually financial kinds of games. If I do this and they do that, like what would be the best outcome? Uh, we're going to talk about graph theory today. That's what those sheets are that if you had a chance to download, you can get. Simulation models are for really complicated problems that maybe you can't solve with just equations. So you build a little computer replication. I think about like maybe Walt Disney World when they're trying to figure out like how much space do they need for the, the queue, the line. So they can build a little model and show the people getting onto the roller coaster and then they, you know, how fast things were and they can look to see like how much space do they need. Um, supply chain management is what I teach in. That is the area, as I mentioned about how do we get stuff kind of from the beginning to the end to the customer. Um, manufacturing, marketing, revenue management, that, that's like the airlines. I don't know if you've ever had to try to buy a plane ticket, but different days when you go to their website, the ticket will 
cost you different amounts. So like if you know you want to fly from Roanoke to Chicago on April 14th, if you start looking at the prices, it'll change over time. Why do they do that? That's an area of uh, operations research called revenue management. Uh, can also use these tactics for military applications. It's actually where they began. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff, the airline industry, transportation industry. So this happens kind of all over the place. Uh, another term that's very common these days is called analytics. So I wanted to just talk to you about what does analytics mean? Okay, so um, and it's a big buzzword. It's really nothing that we haven't been doing. We've been doing analytics all along, but it kind of got this new name. So it's a good one to put on your resumes. Um, so analytics basically means transforming data into insight so that you make better decisions. So there's different ways that this happens. But basically what we're talking about is you look at your past data and you're trying to figure out trends. So that you can make better decisions. Uh, that's basically the idea. So where does this happen? For example, Amazon, every time you click on things, they collect that data, right? So like you'll, you'll have maybe shopped for something on Amazon and now you click over to uh, Facebook or Instagram or something. And now suddenly there's an ad for something that you were just shopping for. Obviously that's not a coincidence, right? Everything's happening because they're looking at that data and they're trying to analyze what you like and they're looking at people who bought similar products and what was the path that led them to buy the product and they're trying to satisfy their customers by suggesting products that they might like, okay? So that's one way people are using data analytics. Uh, other companies use it as well, obviously. P&G stands for Procter & Gamble and they do a lot of analysis of their customers' buying habits, and then they try and figure out kind of what items typically go together. Like if I bought this product, what do other people commonly buy with it? And then they suggest to you, you know, that you should buy this other product. So they use simulation models and predictive analysis to try and figure out who's going to buy different products. And uh, hospitals use this kind of stuff. So uh, those of you who are interested in biomed kind of applications, there's there's modeling there as well. So uh, this one particular hospital uses predictive modeling to try and figure out who is most likely to get sick when they get sent home. And then they can uh, give them extra treatments or maybe keep them in the hospital longer. But they have been able to reduce their readmissions from sick people who had heart failure uh, by 31% which is substantial. And so they could use some kind of numbers or data they were seeing from previous patients and, and effectively prevent a third of the relapses of people who had to come back to the hospital. And that obviously saved the money too. Um, other people who are using big data. So Google, you've heard about like self-driving cars. Uh, maybe you've been in a, um, a Tesla. I've driven with my friend who has a Tesla. And they hit this button and it just drives itself, right? It, it knows what to do. So how does that happen? You have to have a lot of data and a lot of analytics to figure out what should happen. Netflix, I'm sure over this last six months, you've been on Netflix constantly. I know my children have, right? Constantly. Netflix was one of the drivers of the whole idea of data analytics uh, because they used to have these cues back when they started, you were actually running DVDs, not streaming, okay? But you would kind of tell it what movies you liked and then it would suggest new things that you like. And they, it still does that, right? But now with streaming shows, they had at one point a million dollar prize and all of these researchers trying to figure out how to make the queue um, better. And, um, and anyway, so Netflix is a huge driver in data analytics. And then there's other stuff like, those of you who do yoga, like smart yoga maths, they're, they're using those with data analytics as well. So all kinds of stuff where we can use data analytics. Why do I tell you that you should care about this? Why am I talking to you about this word analytics? Uh, because if you look at the top right corner here, we, the U.S. Um, brought, used about $5.3 billion in 2018 on big data analytics. 
and it's going to go up to around $20 billion in six years. So this is a hot field. There's lots of um, opportunity for you in any engineering field. They're going to be pushing you to, to let people know you know how to do analytics. Analytics. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner there says Accenture, which is a, a big consulting house, where it says that 80% of executives thinks that if you do not embrace big data, you're going to face extinction. So what, what is analytics, basically? There's three main kinds, but some people add a fourth and a fifth, but I'm just going to tell you the big three. So you have all this data. Like I have a list of every website you've clicked on or all the GPS locations you've been in the last month or you know the text messages you've sent to your friends, whatever the data might be. What do we do? We look down at the bottom. That's where it starts. Once you've got all this data, the first thing you got to do is figure out how to describe it, right? Like I don't want to see an Excel file with a million lines in it that tells me all of the websites you clicked on last month. I don't want to see it, right? I want you to somehow summarize it for me and tell me, okay, what does Kathleen like to do? You know, what these are the kinds of things she goes, the website she goes to, something like that. So that's called descriptive analytics, where you have this huge data file of all this information, and you kind of summarize it neatly. Uh, so you build a dashboard, maybe you do some kind of graphs. Somehow, maybe you calculate the average and the standard deviation, whatever it might be. Somehow, you're going to just say, this is what this person does, okay, based on all the data I have. Then the next kind of analytics is the next one up the pyramid. It's called predictive. So given that I understand how you behave, now I want to try and make a prediction about what's going to happen. So I want to say, I think because she spent this many hours on this website, I think she's going to buy this product and make a prediction, right? So that's where we're talking about forecasting, data mining, regression, simulation, all that kind of stuff. Where I live is the very tip of the pyramid, which is called prescriptive analytics. So prescriptive analytics are uh, kind of, given that I know what's happening and now I've made a prediction about what I think will happen, now I'm going to make a recommendation about what we should do. We should market this product. That's what she's going to want to buy, something like that. So math programming, optimization, decision trees. That's where I live, mostly. Now the classes I teach are the whole pyramid. I teach about how to describe what's going on, how to predict what's going on. But the models I build usually are about prescribing. So I think you've probably all used Google Maps or something similar to that. If we look at um, Google Maps or Waze, any of that kind of stuff, it does these three things. First thing it does is it collects the data about how long it's taking a car on average to travel, let's say, between Blacksburg and Roanoke on 81. And then, so that's the descriptive phase. It collects data from many, many people. You know, your phone is sending that data up to the cloud, right? So it knows every car, how long it took it to go from one point to another. And it can figure out, for example, on average, it took 37 minutes today, okay? That kind of situation. So we collect the data, we can calculate averages, that kind of thing. Then the predictive modeling, what happens is, it looks at historical data and it says, okay, you're going to be driving from Blacksburg to Roanoke on Friday night at five o'clock. How long do you think it's gonna take? So it's gonna factor in, okay, well, it's a Friday, it's five o'clock, there's gonna be a lot of people leaving, maybe I think it'll take 42 minutes. You know? So it makes a prediction about how long it would take you to travel that road. And then ultimately what it does is it, if you ask it to, uh, and you say, okay, I need to go from here to there. What roads should I take? And it solves an optimization problem. And it says, this is the path you should take. Okay, so that's kind of how things work. Uh, so again, this is basically the same information. It says, kind of, how do we get here? What do we think is going to happen? And then what should we do? And um, the same kind of stuff is summarized up here again. So descriptive, what's happening now? Okay, collect the data, see what's happening right now. Predictive, 
look at what's happened in the past to make a prediction. So for example, Southwest Airlines is going to track sensor data about how different parts on the plane are performing. And based upon in the past, what other planes have done, they're going to try and schedule a maintenance procedure before they think something's going to break. Okay? If they think, well, you know, this typically breaks after 100 flights, Maybe at 90, 95, they're going to replace the parts so that they don't get into a bad situation. And prescriptive, again, is what do I do? What do we prescribe? What should you do? And self-driving cars, for example. How does, how does that Tesla know to slow down? Um, I have a Subaru, it, it, I, it, and it has a, a cruise control feature where it can follow the car in front and kind of keep me a certain distance away from it. How does it do that? So there's a lot. Of engineering involved in there, there's mechanical engineering involved in that, there's electrical engineering, and there's this kind of data analytics as well. Okay, so what I wanted to do um, for the rest of today was um, really talk to you and get you more involved because it's, it's boring to just listen to people talk at you all the time. So I wanted to have us kind of play a couple little kind of mathy game kind of things um, so that you can see some of the stuff you can do within operations research. I decided to go with graph theory just because it's kind of a simple thing. You don't need a lot of background. I don't need to talk to you about calculus and derivatives and stuff. Uh, we can just kind of reason our way through these things, I think. Uh, but uh, first thing I need to let you know is that when we talk about graphs, we're not talking about sometimes what you guys do, um, like bar charts or line graphs and things like that. In math, programming at least, when we talk about a graph, we're talking about something that looks like this. It's a bunch of circles and a bunch of lines. And the lines might have arrows, and they might not. Okay, so we're not talking about a bar chart or a pie graph or a parabola or any kind of graphing that, that you might have done. This is a different beast, okay? So there's different terms for the things that are involved in our graphs. But I guess that there's these circles and the lines. So the circles have different names. Some people call them nodes. Some people call them vertices or a vertex. Um, I can't think of others right now. Um, the lines are sometimes called edges. Sometimes they're called arcs. Sometimes they're called links. But they all really mean the same thing. Okay, so there's a bunch of kind of circle things and lines between them. So maybe your circles are houses and uh, the lines are like uh, electrical lines or cable lines or something that connect them or the sewer. Or maybe your circles are towns and the lines are roads that connect them. Okay, they could be all kinds of things. It could be people in your social network and who's connected with each other on um, LinkedIn or whatever it might be. So any kind of objects that are connected so as I mentioned, the lines, sometimes they have arrowheads and sometimes they don't. If, if you're thinking about this, like maybe a street network where like the circles are um, towns and, and uh, the lines are roads, uh, if it has an arrow on it, it's basically telling you it's a one-way street. Okay, So um, you can walk from A to B, but you can't necessarily walk from B to A. If there's no arrowhead, it really means it's a two-way street. So sometimes people put an arrow on both sides, but usually we just leave them off entirely. Uh, so if all of your arrows, if every line has an arrowhead, we call it a directed graph. If none of them do, we call it an undirected graph. Sometimes you got some of each, some one-way streets, some two-way streets. We call that a mixed graph, but that's not on this picture. But the basic idea is it's a formal way to represent a network. So a collection of objects that are all interconnected somehow. So these could be, you know, terminals, if you like electrical engineering that are connected with wires, whatever you want. So the very first graph theory problem is very, very old. It's called the Konigsberg bridge problem. And this is a problem that um, was solved in the year 1736. So it's older than the United States. Okay, But this is the basic idea of it. So first thing is uh, that it was developed by a very, very famous mathematician. So some of you, I would guess, um, have already had calculus or you will have calculus. Is that right? 
Anybody out there? Got, have you been in calculus, some of you, or you will be, right? Um, so a very famous mathematician is this lettered guy. And the first thing I need to make sure I do is make sure I'm telling you that you have to say his name correctly. Because when I was your age, my teacher said it wrong, so then I said it wrong. Um, so like I grew up thinking it was called Euler, Euler. And it's, it's so not, it's Euler, okay? Like O-I-L-E-R, Euler. So hopefully your math teachers are better than mine. But uh, Leonard Euler it was a Swiss, math, Swiss mathematician. He did lots of stuff. You guys are going to learn Euler's method for, for different things in calculus. But um, that's not what we're going to talk about there. That's way too complicated. Uh, so he, he spent a lot of his time working in Germany. And he came up with this question about the seven bridges of Konisberg. Okay, so there's this town that straddles the Pregel River. It was formerly in Prussia. Now it's uh, known as Kal Kal Kaliningrad, sorry, and it's in Russia. Uh, so this particular city was situated close to the mouth of the river and this weird, it had a lot of bridges. It had seven bridges. So this is a drawing of um, Konisberg. So Euler's a really smart guy. And I don't know, one day he just started thinking to himself, I wonder if there's a way that I can take a walk and walk across each of these seven green bridges, the green ones up there, exactly once. Okay, so that's his problem. Can I walk through this town in such a way that I will walk across each bridge exactly one time? Okay, so um, you don't really need the whole map of Konigsberg to try and solve this problem, right? You can kind of just focus in on, on the bridges. You can see there's kind of an island in the middle and then there's these different land masses here. Uh, there's really like four pieces of land, if you look at it. There's kind of like an island, and then there's a peninsula thing to the right of it. But there's also like an upper bank and a lower bank, right? So there's really four pieces of land, and then the seven green bridges there. So he's trying to figure out, okay, can I start? You know, you can pick the starting point. It doesn't matter. Can I start anywhere and walk across these bridges and walk across each of them exactly one time. So we can try and label things a little bit better here. Like I said, there's really four pieces of land. Let's just call them A, B, C, D. And then there's these seven bridges, just so that we give them names, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, okay? whatever you would like them to be. And so Euler says, well, you know, this is really a graph. I could graph this problem right like this. Really, there's these four nodes, a, B, C, D in orange, right? And um, there's these different bridges that connect them. So P and Q both connect A, C, and R and S both connect B and C, et cetera, okay? So this is ultimately what he wants to find. So this is what we call an Euler path. He, he's asking for this map, right? Um, is there an Euler path? So let's look at a simpler one first and see if we can find an Euler path. Uh, so the rules for the Euler path are that you can start wherever you want, but you have to walk across each arc exactly one time. Now you don't have to come back home. So your path, your, your walk might start and end at two different points, that's legit. If you want to impose the fact that um, you have to start and end at the same place, then instead of being an Euler path, we would call it an Euler tour. So tour means you start and end at the same place. But for right now, we're not worrying about tours. We're just worrying about paths. So let's look at this graph here on the left. And somebody tell me, for this graph, is there going to be an Euler path? Is there a way you could basically put your pencil down wherever you want to start and move your pencil across that graph and cross each line exactly one time. So what do you think? Can anybody find one? You'll have to be bold and unmute. If you start at C and then go to B and trace the outer triangle and then the inner. Okay, so you would go C, B, A, C, D, B. Mm -hmm. Everybody agree? Thank you, Maya. Um, so that's an Euler path, right? Now, is it an Euler tour? No, because we started and we ended at two different places. But that's okay. We're just looking for a path right now. 
it would kind of stink if you were, if that were your walk, right? Because now you've ended at a different place, but in some applications, it wouldn't matter. Do you think that's the only routing we could do? No, here's a different one. Okay, so like you might have started at C and then gone up to A and then gone up to B and then D, C, B, right? Okay, so there's different Euler paths, but there is a way to do it, right? So an Euler path in, in, in life means you walk across each arc exactly once. For testing purposes, what we would do is we could put our pencil down and try and move our pen across each of the arcs, right? Exactly one time. Okay, so that's basically the problem. So we understand it kind of on a smaller scale, but now the question becomes, what about this problem? You can pick your starting point, A, B, C, D. Can you draw each line P, Q, R, S, T, U only once without picking up your paper, picking up your pencil, sorry, uh, from the paper? And this is a hard problem. So like, you might look at it and you'd be like, well, I don't see one. But just because you don't see one, does that necessarily mean it doesn't exist? Okay, so in math, we can't just say, well, I don't see one. I mean, you, you could try for a while. This one's kind of a complicated graph though. So he, he started with a, a pretty complicated one. So what I thought we would do, instead of jumping right into Konigsberg, but he said, let's look at some other ones and see if we can determine some patterns about maybe what's going on here. So let's look at some real simple graphs. Well, the first one's super simple. And I think we all see that clearly in graph number one, it's possible, right? Everybody agree that you can, that one actually has a tour, right? You can just walk around the, the rectangle and you can get right back to where you started. What about number two? Somebody look at number two for a minute and tell me, is there a way to trace all of those edges exactly one time? And it, maybe the first time you try it, you can't figure out how to do it, but if you try it, you've started a different place, you can figure it out. So can anybody see a way for number two? Be bold. If you go through the middle line and then trace the outside, Okay, so you're gonna like start at maybe the bottom right, go top left, then go right down, left up. Good. Okay, something like that. Sounds good. Um, what about number three? And if, if, if you wanna copy these down, I, I have trouble doing these visually. I need to like use my pencil. So if you wanna jot anything down, you're welcome. Anybody find a number three? Sounds kind of tough. Just simmer on up for a minute, see if anybody can find one. Anybody thinking this isn't gonna be possible? This is the problem with these things is that um, like, like sometimes you become convinced, well, nobody can do that, right? I don't think that one's possible. But you have to be able to prove it's not possible and mathematically, right? And if we're going to get to that point. But I'm going to put you out of your misery and I'm going to tell you three is not possible. Okay. So if you think you found three, check again. That one's not going to work. Okay. And I'll put you out of your misery too. If you started, did you start looking at four? Four is going to be impossible too. I happen to know the math behind these, so I'm just trying to put you out of your misery a little earlier. But you can try. You can put your pen down and see if you can draw that shape without picking up your paper. Wherever you start, you, there's like this one line you can't get back to, right? I, I can get it down to like maybe every line except one, but then I can't. How about number five? I bet you can do number five. Anybody get it? Yep. 
All right, Maya, what do you got? Where are you going to start? I did at the bottom right corner. Okay. And then I did a loop all the way to the top right dot at the top of the square. And then okay. I diagonally down to the bottom right, left to the bottom left, up to the top right, and then finished out the square. Okay. Makes sense. Anybody else get a different way? It's kind of hard to see at first. Um, okay. But you're kind of getting the pattern. And I remember like some of these back when I was in elementary school, I think we, we like would draw number seven and, and like, we would, is there a way you can draw number seven? Uh, and there is, uh, isn't, um, anybody see number seven? I'm just jumping over there. doesn't matter. It matters where you start, by the way. If you put your pencil down at the wrong place, you might get stuck and not find an answer. And as you're drawing, if you make a wrong decision, you might not see it. But there should be a way to do number seven. All right, who's, who's getting it? Somebody who's being shy. Anybody over there? I think I might have gotten it. Okay, so is that awesome? Yeah. Okay, uh, tell us. At the bottom right corner. Okay. And then uh, you go up and then side. Okay. Um, and then back down and then to the side again so you finish the square. Okay. And then go up the diagonal to the left and okay. then up to like the, the roof and, yeah. then to the and then down to the left. Awesome. Looks like you got it, right? So you basically see it. So, so now what mathematicians would do, people in, who deal with graph theory problems do, would be starting to think to themselves, um, is there a pattern here about what we can do it for and what we can't? And I have the answers up there. I gave you the answers too fast. Sorry. I clicked over to where the answers were. Um, and it says over here, there's this column here where it says evens and odds. What do you think that means? If you look at number, it says for shape number one, there were four evens and zero odds. What do you think that means? Anybody understand what that's saying? If you were going to describe graphs, one of the things you might do is describe how many edges or links or arcs come out of every node, right? That's something that's called the degree of a node. Okay, I don't want to get too technical with math, but what do you see about number one? What's the degree of every single node there? Two, right? What about graph number two? Like the bottom left-hand corner, what's its degree? Two. Top left, top left, what do you see? It's three. Three, right? Top right, two, bottom right, three. So that's what they, they started kind of looking at these patterns, right? About how many of the nodes had an even degree and how many of the nodes had an odd degree. And then we can trace that. Oops, sorry, click that button. We can compare that to um, whether or not, oh, I've lost my little slide. There it is. That's what I wanted. Uh, we can compare that to whether or not the shape had an Euler path. And do you see a pattern? The ones that, the ones that didn't work both had four odds. Okay. So what is your hypothesis? If you're going to have an Euler path, what should happen? The number of odd nodes should be what? Two or fewer. Two or fewer. It seems like a reasonable hypothesis, and that's actually the answer. Okay. Now, when you say two or fewer, it turns out that um, the number of odd nodes is never going to be well you, you've seen very limited graphs right here but if you look at that table what are the numbers you see there zero two and four so what's your hypothesis right now the number of odds nodes is always going to be an even number 
right? It's zero to a four. And you can mathematically prove that because um, when you're adding up the degree, really you're counting how many ends there are to all the arcs, right? And every arc has two ends, right? It has a left and a right or an up and a down, whatever it might be. So you can mathematically prove that, the, that when you add things together, it has to be an even number because it's twice the number of, of arcs. So we can't have an odd number of odd nodes ever. So you're either going to have zero, two, four. That's getting a little technical. You don't need all that. But this is the kind of things that we think about mathematically when we're trying to figure out how to do these kind of problems. So your theory is that if you're going to have an Euler path, the number, you can have odd nodes, but you can't have any more than two of them. That's our hypothesis right now, right? So we're kind of in agreement on that. So um, what does that tell us about the problem we've started talking about, this bridge problem? Is he going to be able to cross every bridge exactly once and get back home? Who wants to explain it to us? Is there going to be one in this graph? No. All right, he's talking. I can't see it. I'm sorry. I said no just because there's it? right. I see it. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's four points and they all are even or all are odd. Right. As soon as you see more than two odd nodes, you're out. Okay, so that is the answer. Now, I haven't proved that to you. There's a big mathematical proof, and I could do it for you, but it would be really boring. You wouldn't want to see that. But in real life, we would have to go through that step, right? We can't just say, hey, we saw this pattern, and that's what happens. We have to use induction and all kinds of different mathematical proof techniques to try and prove that that's possible. Uh, so the answer is correct. Euler did not have um, – he did not have – an Euler path in his atmosphere. Uh, by the way, it matters where you start, right? So if you look back here, um, let's see, look at graph two. If you start in the lower left-hand corner, can you can you trace all those arcs once? Try it. If you start over here, will it work? You can go up, down, over, up, up, but then I can't get back here, right? What if you start in the top right? Will it work if you start there? It's really the same thing. It's just symmetric, right? So we're going to get stuck if we start, start in the top right also. So where would you, those of you who could do number two, where did you start? You had to start either top left or bottom right. In terms of degree, what does that mean? You can have something with two odd degrees, right? But you have to start at the one with the odd and you're going to end at somebody who's odd. Makes sense? You can't, if like, even in this graph, there should be a path here, an Euler path. But if you don't start at an odd node, you won't find it. Um, last little thing about Euler stuff before we move on to a different graph problem is remember the idea of a tour is not only do you walk over each bridge once, but you start and end at the same spot. It turns out, I'll just tell you the answer, that um, if that's going to be possible, you can't have any odd nodes, any odd nodes at all. So just looking at these eight pictures over here, the only one where it's possible would be number one. So if you have two odd nodes, you can find a path, but you're going to start at one odd node and you're going to end at the other odd node. But the only way you can get back home is if there's no odd nodes. Again, there's a lot of math into proving why that is, but we're just trying to think about kind of mathematical problems. Um, I just threw that one out there because that was the first problem that we ever had in graph theory. Again, very famous mathematician, did lots of important stuff, the least of which is probably that problem, but it's fun to just think about. Um, but something that's more applicable to like what we actually do in real life is what's called a min spanning tree problem. Okay. So I need to explain to you what a tree is and what a spanning tree is, but I'm just going to put it all at once. If you have a graph that has, you know, a bunch of circles, a bunch of lines, if you are a spanning tree, 
it means that you have all the nodes and you have just enough arcs to keep the graph connected. What do I mean by connected? I mean, basically everybody's stitched together. No node is like floating off by itself, something like that. So you might have a graph that looks like this. Um, this is what's called a grid graph. That's fine. It's very neat and orderly. It's got lots of arcs. It's got all these maroon arcs that you can see there. But it didn't select every single arc. It only selected the blue ones. So if you ignore the ones that aren't colored blue, is everybody still connected? Are there any nodes that are like floating off apart from others? No, like they're all connected, right? Like if you only walked on the blue, you could get from any dot to any other dot. It's possible, right? So that's called a tree. Um, by the way, what would happen if I took away any one of those blue arcs? So any one you see, just kind of put your finger over it or cross it off in your head. If I get rid of any one of those blue arcs, is it still connected? No, somebody would, some chunk of nodes would be kind of cut off from everybody else, right? So for example, if you cut off the, the vertical arc on the top left, right? If you cut that, snip that arc away, then the, the top left node would be floating all by itself. If you looked on the right here, um, that vertical blue line on the far right, if I removed that, what's going to happen? Like kind of there's like a top half and there's a bottom half. And you can move them on the bottom, you can move them on the top, but the top can't get to the bottom, right? So if we take away any one of these arcs, what's going to happen is it's going to be disconnected. What happens if you add an arc? So like if I added one extra arc, like if, suppose I took uh, the very top left-hand corner and I colored the arc from the left to the right. So I added this kind of top left-hand arc and I colored that blue. It wouldn't be, a, yeah, go ahead, tell, explain. It wouldn't be a minimum number of arcs anymore because there'd it be. It wouldn't be minimum, right. And specifically what will happen if you put an extra one in is you form what's called a cycle. A cycle's like a loop, okay? Like basically those top four nodes on the left are already connected. So if you colored this one blue, you made some kind of a loop and it was unnecessary. So you could think of like maybe the maroon the arcs here as being like unpaved roads and we're going to decide which blue roads we're going to put pavement on okay so that everybody can move between these houses on some kind of paved surface it might be way out of the way but somehow you can get between every house on a paved surface okay so if you don't have enough blue arcs somebody's going to be disconnected and if you have too many blue arcs really you spent extra money on pavement you didn't need it okay so here's some other uh, examples. This is a really simple graph. It's basically a triangle, right? A, B, C. Uh, there's different ways you could decide to pave those roads. Like you could pave A to B and B to C. And now everybody's connected. If I take one of those arcs out, they're disconnected. So it's a minimum spanning tree, right? Um, it's a, yeah. And then the one in the middle, maybe somebody else would say no. I want to connect roads, um, houses A and C, and then A and B. And somebody else might have said, no, I'm going to do C, A, C, B. Okay, so there's different ways that you can connect them. Here's another graph. This one's a little bit more complicated. Again, we want some way to kind of connect everybody together. There's three different ways you could decide to pave these roads so that all the houses are now connected by paved roads. Do you see a pattern for how many arcs we're going to need? Yeah, there's one less arc for the amount of nodes. Yeah, very good. So um, if a graph has n nodes, how many arcs were going to be in its tree? So if a graph, if I give you a one that had 10 nodes, well, let's go back to this one. How many were here? What is that? Uh, 16 nodes, right? So we got four times four, right? 16 nodes. How many blue arcs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You get 15? Okay, so again, we haven't proved it. I can prove it. I know how to prove it. But I'm just, we're just gonna not prove anything. It's the summer. Nobody wants to prove anything. All right, so you kind of see the pattern, right? You're going to select, um, if out of these end nodes, 
you're going to pave n minus one arcs, but you got to be careful. You can't pick any three arcs. For example, um, in the one on the right here, you couldn't have picked AC, CD, and AD, right? That little triangle, because that wouldn't have connected B, right? So you need N minus one arcs, but you need them in such a way that they're really connecting a new node in the tree, right? So what's the idea of a minimum spanning tree? In a minimum spanning tree, what we're saying is there's different ways to connect all these houses with paved route or maybe it's you know houses with cable or modems or whatever it might be um out of all the different ways you could hook them up if you told me like how expensive it was to connect different sets of things i would want to pick the cheapest one right so out of all the possible spanning trees you could have if the numbers beside them either represent how long they are or how much time they take or how much money they take I would want to pick one that was extra cheap. Okay, make sense? All right, so what we're going to do is play with this graph. And I'm going to see if we could figure out what's the cheapest way to pave these roads. So uh, if you can print that picture out, you're welcome to. If not, um, just copy it down from the screen. It's not too hard. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time here uh, to try and see what you can do. Like, what would your strategy be? We, let's make sure we're all on the same page. There's seven nodes here. So how many arcs are we going to need? I see you saying it. You're all muted. Six, right? You're going to need to pick six. And you're going to need to pick six in such a way that they're all connected. So there's lots of ways to build a tree. But out of all the ways you can build that tree, I want you to pick the tree that when you add together the numbers on the arcs, it's as small as possible. Sound good? All right, so this takes a little bit and then um, you're gonna have to like add some numbers. So where I live, like we don't add by hand anymore. So grab a calculator or grab a phone. Like the days of doing arithmetic on a piece of paper are long gone for me. So uh, check your arithmetic on a computer or uh, a calculator, whatever you wanna do, but see what you can do. I'm going to um, give you a few minutes here. Just think on your own. And we're going to come back in like three minutes. And we're going to see who found the cheapest way to connect to these nodes. All right, let's just check in. Somebody be bold and tell me, did you find a tree? And what was the total amount of, uh, let's just, whatever we wanted, but whatever the total number is for your tree. And we'll see if anybody... I to find it. My number was 72. Okay, who's saying that? It's Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Okay, and Jillian's saying the same thing. Anybody beat 72? Okay, well, first of all, they're going to need to prove to us that it worked. So, um, Elizabeth, tell us which arcs you picked. I did the one from Oops. two. Oh, sorry, I'm clicking on things accidentally. Go ahead. I did one to three where the nine is, and then um, three to four where the 15 is. Mm -hmm. Two to four where 12 is. Four to five where the 14 is. Five to seven where the eight is. And then seven to six where the 14 is. Okay, and Jillian, is that what you did too? Uh, yeah. Okay. So two people got 72. Very good, because that's the answer. Very well done. What was your strategy? Um, either uh, Jillian or anybody else who might have had that. What, like, where did you start? Like, what were you thinking? Um, well, I started from the middle, but um, I think. Okay, so there's different ways to solve this problem. So anyway, you started at, like, what, number four? Yeah. Okay, and what did you want to do? Um, I looked at the path that was um, had the least number, um, which was from four to two. Okay. And from there, I could go two to five, but that'd be 25. And I could go two to one, but um, there was an easier way to get to one without um, connecting more nodes and using less points. Okay. Um, less points with less values. So I went to four to three to one instead because I would connect two more nodes. Okay. And then from there, um, 
I still had to connect five, seven, and six. And um, out of all the possible ways to go that route, um, from four to five to seven to six was the one with the least possible points. So it's just kind of like guess and check. Yeah. Guess and check is probably not a great mathematical approach in general, but it worked on this one. Uh, probably if I give you a more complicated graph, it might not. Uh, but that's interesting. Now, uh, Elizabeth, did you use the same strategy or did you start somewhere else? Or I do? started, I saw which numbers were the least. So I saw that five and seven had eight and then one and three had nine. So I knew I, I had you to go there first. Yeah. yeah. And then I just kind of, found which paths were like the smallest numbers from there. Okay. So there's actually two different algorithms to solve this problem. One's called Kruskal's algorithm because it was invented by Kruskal. And one's called Prim's algorithm because it was invented by Prim. And honestly, I'm afraid I'm going to tell you which one is which backwards right now. So I don't want to tell you which is which. Um, I have to look that up. But there's kind of two different strategies. And they're similar to the two different approaches that you two took. Okay, so I'm going to show you one, but the other one was basically start anywhere. So one of you, um, was it Jillian? You said you wanted to start at node four. Okay. And this approach says, wherever you start from, grab the next closest node. So it did exactly what you would have, and it would have gone from four to two. And kind of if you're in the tree, you could think of like maybe coloring that node in, right? Like, so now two and four are colored, right? They're in our tree. Uh, and then after that, now you're allowed to grow the tree off of either number two or number four. Okay, so what's the next new node that's closest to either two or four? So um, if you grow off of two, you've only got a 16 and a 25. But if you grow up a four, you've got a 14, right? So that would now bring in node five. And then um, now you can grow off of two, four, or five. So five has that eight. So it's going to grab that arc with an eight. So that was kind of the approach I think Jillian said she was kind of taking, a little bit different in the middle. Uh, the other option is uh, what Elizabeth said, which is basically just, um, oops, he's entered the way here. So I'll let her back in. Uh, the other approach is just um, the other way, which says find the absolute cheap, cheapest arc on this network and put it in your tree. So that, I think, is what um, Elizabeth did, right? You said, I want that eight because it's cheap, right? So grab that one. And then you said, now I want the nine because that's cheap. And you kind of just, you're, both of these are what are called greedy algorithms. You do what feels good right now, right? Uh, keep grabbing cheap arcs. Like then you grab the 14 and then you grab that 14. Now, when you get to the 15s, if you had looked at that 15 next, would you take that? from four to six, you don't want that one, right? Because if you went from four to six, that would be wasted pavement, right? Because it makes a loop. All of these things were already. So so you kind of add them, but you only add them if they're bringing in a new component, right? If they're going to connect something that's already connected, then you cross that one out. Don't use that. And then you grab this 15, and then you get this answer, 72, which was great. A lot of you came up with that on your own. So we're running out of time, so we're just going to do one more math problem here. Um, and I used to do this example. It's called minimum dominating set. Again, I'm just sticking with this graph theory because these are simple kind of mind games we can play. By the way, this problem, there was a very simple, greedy algorithm. You could have taught, like if you have a younger brother and sister who knows how to add in like middle school or something, you could have taught the logic of how to solve that problem. Very simple problem. There's other problems that are very, very complicated and people still can't figure out efficient algorithms for. So I don't want you to think that all of these things are really super simple because they're not. Uh, so this one's called a minimum dominating set. And I used to teach this and uh, the example I gave, I, I'd give people this map and I would say, okay, we need to locate ice cream parlors so that everybody's close enough to an ice cream parlor. But I thought in today's environment, let's change it to virus testing. So suppose that the government came up with this new policy that said, we need to get more people to take these virus tests. So the rule is, you either need to have virus testing in your town or in an adjacent town. So adjacent means there's a road that connects you. Okay, now it's fine if there's more than that. So you might have both. You might have, 
or there might be multiple towns that you're adjacent to that both have testing facilities. You can have more than this, but you have to add a minimum, either have a virus testing place in your circle or at one of your neighbors. So graphically, let's think about this as each town being a vertex and an edge or an arc connecting them if they're adjacent. So basically, every node either needs to have its own testing center or a testing center that's only one arc away from it, one road. But the thing is, these testing centers are expensive, so the government doesn't want to have to build more of them than necessary. Okay, so they want to build the, the least number, but they want to make sure everybody either has one in their town or right next to them. So what our goal is to try and figure out how many do they need. So here's a map, real simple example. And this one has what, is that six towns? A, B, C, D, E, F, right? So obviously one option would be just put a, put a testing center on every single circle. I could build six testing centers and clearly that satisfies the government policy, but it's gonna be super expensive, right? So the government doesn't wanna do that. So do you need six? Can anybody do it with three? Remember the rule is if you put a dot down, you need to, uh, you have to make sure that every dot is either has a red dot on top of it or next to it. If we build one at E and one at C, we can build it in two. E and C, you can do it in two. Oh, you jumped right to the answer. All right, well, I thought we'd have to step our way there. But um, okay, so here you could get it down to three. Can you do even better? You girls are too smart, that's great. So E and C is an option. Is there another option that would be a two, an two answer? A and C. Let me think about that one, A and C. Think so, right? Anything else? There's probably lots of other options. A and D. A and D, think that would work? And B and C works too, right? Okay, so now we kind of understand the problem, right? So let's just kick it up a little bit in terms of uh, more complicated graphs. What about this guy? Obviously we could do it in eight. We can do better than eight though, right? Anybody got it? How many can you get it in? We'll see if we can do even better. How many is it taking you guys, ladies? Okay, I think I found one in two. Okay, somebody found two. That's impressive. Anybody got like three or four? I should have numbered them so that we could talk about better what, which ones we're talking about. Here's an answer with four. Does that work? Everybody agree with that? That would be a four option. One of you said you think you can do two and I can do two as well. So if you're gonna, who said they could do two? I did. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see you. Who are you? Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Sorry, missed you. Where would you do your two? Um, I, they don't have numbers, so I'm sorry. I'll try to describe it. I'm like the very upper right corner, and then in the inner rectangle, the bottom left. Awesome. Awesome job. I was looking at that last night because I haven't done this for a while, and I'm like, it took me a while to find the two. I'm like, I knew the answer was two, and I'm like, I can't remember where they are. Uh, so um, does that work? Does everybody agree? Look at all the white dots. Are all the white dots connected to at least one red dot? That's what the rule basically says, right? So yeah, you could, right? But obviously things get even more complicated. If I threw this one at you, like what's your strategy? Where do you even start, right? Like we need to kind of develop an algorithm and a process. And when things get complicated, you might not say right away. I hand drew this and I cheated because I kind of made the answer first and then I connected some extra roads to make it look different. But um, I'll let you look at that one on your own 
I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is. I'm going to slide past it first, but I'm going to tell you that the answer is going to be six. So do you get some extra time later today? See if you can figure out what that one would be. Okay. But the idea here is, well, there's the answer. No, I told you. I wasn't going to show you. But uh, the answer is, I'm telling you the answer is six, but really that's not sufficient in real life. In real life, we would need to prove that. Like, how do we know there's not five? And like on those graphs where we said there were two, it's pretty easy to say, well, the answer can't be one, right? Obviously, uh, in those graphs, we can make an argument. So if I can find two, then clearly that's going to be the answer. But like, how do you prove that that was six? So there's a lot of math involved. There's a lot of proving. And it doesn't necessarily feel like engineering, but this is the kind of stuff some kinds of engineers do. So um, just to wrap up, I wanted to remind you that what I do is called Operations Research and Management Science. It's a great way for you to apply math to real world problems, particularly if you like math, but you're really not a ton into science. Like you don't want to get your hands dirty with the biology and the chemistry and that kind of stuff. Uh, these areas are really at the intersection of engineering and business. So you can study them in the College of Engineering or you can study them in the College of Business. College of Engineering, uh, if you want to design the algorithms and you want to be really under the hood, that's a better place for you. If you prefer to make more money, College of Business is a good place for you. Uh, job prospects are outstanding for both. The work is challenging. It's meaningful. You can, like I said, I, I can build problems about how to route things across a network and save UPS money. Or I have done other applications where we're trying to figure out, you know, which parts, uh, like where radiation beams should be targeted to treat a cancer tumor. So whatever you can model mathematically, you can solve. So it's really, really cool. So I wanted to make sure you knew, whoops, um, that this is my name and my email and uh, my office address, just in case some other future point you're like, hey, I have a question about engineering or business or whatever it might be. I wanted you to know that you can uh, reach out to me and um, I'll be happy to get back with you. Do you guys have any questions for me before you head off? Do you have another meeting now right at 11? Yes. Okay. So I better let you go to that. But if you have questions and you want to stick around and chat, you're welcome to do that and show up late to your next thing and just say it was my fault. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day.